So he sat down in meditation to think how I should write this. How should I make all these issues clear to people? And in his meditation, he was getting realizations. And as he wrote down the realizations, he didn't want to come out of his meditative trance too far. So he just wrote very short little notes, like you might write in a class while hearing a lecture. Uh, if you write down notes in your notebook during a class, if anybody else looked at them, they wouldn't make any sense. But if you look at your notes, you know what they mean because you wrote them. Similarly, if you look at Vedat Vyasadeva's notes from meditation, and you don't know what he's talking about, you wouldn't have a clue. Now, just to read the sutras all by themselves is very daunting. You have to have some kind of commentary. So someone might ask, well, why didn't Vyasadeva write a commentary? And the answer is, he did. And that commentary is called Srimad Bhagavatam. And it's interesting, it's stated in the Kurma Purana, which is one of the oldest Puranas going all the way back to the beginning of the universe, that Srimad Bhagavatam is the commentary on Vedanta. So we're not just making this up. It's been known for many, many thousands of years that Srimad Bhagavatam is the original commentary by the original author of the sutras. So the question might be asked, well, why do we need another commentary? And the answer is that times change, situations change, and people change. The issues that they're concerned with change, especially going from one yuga to another. Uh, the Srimad Bhagavatam was written down 5,000 years ago in the Dvapara Yuga. But now we're into Kali Yuga, and so a lot of things have changed. For example, when Srimad Bhagavatam was written, most educated people had already studied the Four Vedas and the Upanishads and all that. In fact, even when our predecessor spiritual master, Baladev Vidyabhushan, wrote his commentary, this was about 450 years ago. And in India, at least, most educated people at least had some idea about what was in the Vedas and Upanishads and could even quote things from them. Huh? But today, hardly anybody has read the Vedas and Upanishads. I have to be honest with you, I haven't even read them. Huh? Not fully, anyway. I've read quotes from them and sections of them. Uh, but never read the complete Vedas and Upanishads. Why? Because my spiritual master told me that I'm a great fool. <laughs> this is what uh, uh, Lord Chaitanya said. Lord Chaitanya uh, was challenged once by the Mayavadi sannyasis. Why aren't you studying Vedanta? Why are you just chanting the holy name like a fanatic? Huh? What's wrong with you? You're a sannyasi, you're supposed to study Vedanta. And Lord Chaitanya said, well, I guess you're, uh, you're right, but my spiritual master told me that I'm a great fool, that I can't really understand Vedanta. And so I should just chant the holy name, and that would give me everything I need for spiritual advancement. So this made them really think, because Lord Chaitanya was well known as being the greatest scholar of his time. So if he isn't qualified to study Vedanta, who is? Right? And of course the answer is almost nobody. <laughs> because to really study Vedanta you have to know the Upanishads inside and out. And this means a lifetime of study uh, in a Vedic academy with a bona fide spiritual master. And who is able to do that? In these days, almost nobody. Uh, so we need an easy way to understand the truths of Vedanta Sutra without having to become experts in all the different Vedic subjects and background knowledge. So this was given in Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam means the beautiful story of the personality of Godhead. Bhagavan. Bhagavan means the supreme personality of Godhead. And specifically it means one who is full, who is complete, 
in six opulences. That are those are power, wealth, fame, knowledge, beauty, and renunciation. Anyone who is complete, full, uh, unlimitedly opulent in those six qualities is fit to be called the personality of Godhead. So we see there's been many incarnations, many appearances of the Supreme Person in this universe since the beginning of time. And the most prominent of these are narrated in Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, the story of Narsingha Dev is there, and the story of uh, Matsya Avatar, Kurma Avatar, Vaman Avatar, and so many others. Ram, and uh, of course, the highlight is the pastimes of Krishna, which took place only 5,000 years ago in Vrindavan. So we can understand by reading Srimad Bhagavatam that the actual conclusion of Vedanta Sutra is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That means the real subject of the Vedas is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Parabrahma. Uh, Param means the highest, and Brahman means the source of everything. Uh, so, if the ultimate subject of the Vedas is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, that means that this is the actual subject of the whole Vedas. Just like in my book, uh, my example, uh, if I'm writing a book on uh, musical composition, I may have to cover so many other subjects just to explain what I'm talking about in terms of musical concepts. Uh, so similarly, the Vedas, if they're talking about the highest level of God realization, they may have to discuss so many other subjects first. And the reader may have to become qualified in those subjects before he is fit to actually understand the conclusion of, of the book. So this is why the Vedas seem to take so much time and space to explain about things that may seem mundane, like different religious rituals, different yogic practices, uh, different kinds of meditation, and the structure of the society, and oh, so many other things. Because these are prerequisites for realizing God. And if we don't understand these prerequisites, or actually haven't become realized in those prerequisites, how can we realize the ultimate subject matter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead? It's not possible. Therefore, the Vedas go step by step. And if you study the four Vedas, and then the Upanishads, and then the Vedanta, and then the Puranas, especially Srimad Bhagavatam, you will understand all these things. So, Srila Prabhupada knew that we didn't have much time. So, he said, you read Bhagavad Gita, and then you read Srimad Bhagavatam, and you'll have the background necessary to realize the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He knew we didn't have time to study all the Upanishads and Vedanta and all that stuff, because there are so many issues raised. Uh, however, now we're at a point where it's pretty clear that just by understanding the uh, conclusion of the Vedic literature doesn't mean that we automatically acquire the qualifications to realize it. ISKCON was a perfect example of that. Because even though there were so many people chanting Hare Krishna, uh, performing Artik and Kirtan and deity worship, and so many other things, still there were so many problems. And how many actually became self-realized? Uh, very few. So we can understand there's something missing. And Srila Prabhupada gave the clue when he said, I want to have three levels of examinations. Bhakti Shastri would be uh, examination on Bhagavad Gita and Sri Ishapanishad. Bhakti Vaibhava would be an examination on Srimad Bhagavatam and Nectar of Devotion. 
And finally, the uh, Bhakti Vedanta examination would be on Chaitanya Charitamrita and Vedanta Sutra. There's several letters where Srila Prabhupada wrote about this. He wanted these three examinations, three levels of scholarship. Uh, and he said anyone who passes the Bhakti Vedanta examination would be able to initiate disciples. So this is very clear. How you become a, uh, a guru in our lineage following Srila Prabhupada is to have comprehensive knowledge of all the scriptures including Vedanta Sutra. But Prabhupada didn't get to translate and comment on Vedanta Sutra uh, because he untimely left this world. So 